All right, guys, let's make a start. Um, so, uh, we did in the tutorial yesterday a uh, relatively complex shaft, a couple of gears on it. That's pretty indicative of the types of problems that you might get in, um, in the tutorials for the next few weeks. We might get a little bit more complicated on the exam, or I might phrase it in terms that um, are, uh, say, a real machine component, so a picture of, and you have to, you know, work things out to make it a little bit more complicated, but basically that's where we're at. So we're starting to add multiple different types of stresses together. And you will have seen yesterday that you had probably four stress elements, top, bottom, left and right in that section there. Um, and you had some combinations of normal stress and shear stress. Some of the shear stress added, some of the shear stress subtracted. It was relatively obvious to us that the one with the 300 megapascal normal stress was a little bit more critical than the one with the 160 odd shear stress because the normal stress one had a shear stress on it as well. But there's plenty of examples where the combination of stress vectors isn't going to be obvious. So you might have 150 normal stress and 50 shear stress and then uh, you know, uh, 200 normal stress. Which one of those is the more critical? It's very difficult, if not impossible, to tell just by looking at the vectors. You can't add them together because they're vectors. So vector this way, vector this way, vector this way, you can't add them together. Um, and so what we need is a, a different methodology. And so that's what we're going to be working on today. If you look at those three examples that I put there, it's not clear. I mean, we don't have magnitudes, but this could be a big magnitude and these could be relatively small. Or that could be big and that could be small, but you know they cancel out a little bit or move it around a little bit or whatever. We don't know which one's more critical. And so, there's a few ways we actually um, kind of combine those stresses into something that we can compare each element by. Um, and a few different ways, one of them is what I'm going to be talking today about, is our principal stresses. Hands up who remembers principal stresses from CS 2001 or 4. Cool? So, um, effectively, every single stress element that we have is a cube, which means that there is three-dimensional stresses on it. That's drawn in 2D. doesn't mean there's not three-dimensional stresses on it. It just means that there's only stresses in a 2D plane. That is a cube, and it just means that out of the plane, there's zero stress. All right? And on that front face, there's zero stress as well. All right? Every single time you draw a cube like that, it is a cube in three dimensions, regardless of what it's drawn like. All right? It just means that out of the page there's nothing, and on that front face there's nothing, it's just top and sides. Now, we have calculated our applied stresses to that cube, but that's not necessarily the maximum configuration of stress in that cube, because if we rotate the reference frame around, the stress state stays the same throughout the shaft or beam or whatever, but we're just taking a representative cube, so we subtract a cube at this angle, or we subtract a cube at this angle, or this angle, whichever angle we want, and you'll get different stresses on the face because the actual way that the force distributes through that shaft, we're talking about force lines, remember stress is force over area. So those force lines, the way they distribute through a cross section will mean that the stress state will be different depending on where we actually cut that cube out of. So if we take our applied stress and we rotate our reference frame around, those stresses will change. And at some point, as you'll all be familiar, you rotate it around to a point and you might have to rotate it in all three dimensions. You rotate it around to a point where the normal stresses are maximum and our shear stresses are zero. And somewhat strangely, every single stress state in every single bit of material ever can be rotated around to a point where the shears disappear. All right? You can't necessarily rotate them around to a point where all the normal stresses disappear because the point of maximum shear might still have some normal stresses there. But you can always find a point, some sort of rotation in space where you've only got normal stresses but you've, no got, you've not got any shear. And that configuration, as you will know, is called our uh, principal stress. Well, those three stresses are our principal stresses. And so, if we were to calculate the principal stresses of each of our candidate stress elements, then we could start to compare, you know, the maximum principal, minimum principal, maximum shear, that kind of stuff, and use that as 
kind of a, a comparative metric for which one is more critical. And we start to relate those to failure criterion as well. Right? So principal stress is very useful. Everyone will have seen these two equations, hopefully. Our maximum and our minimum principal stress. Everyone seen those equations? Yes? Does everyone know how they're derived? Could anyone derive one of these equations on the fly if they tried? No? I'll show you how they're derived in a second. Um, so this, these two equations might be what you're familiar with. And effectively what they're doing is in a 2D space, so remembering that we're in 3D space and we have stress out of the page, it's just zero in this circumstance. These two are just working out wherever the rotation is. So we take that element and we rotate around until we get a maximum and a minimum. And those maximum and minimum, the maximum generally positive, but they could both be positive or negative, or one positive and one negative. Okay? Now what we're actually saying is that our three principal stresses, and when we indicate from now on when you're talking about principal stresses, you will call them sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. All right? And in every single circumstance where I ask for principal stresses, I require three. In this circumstance, the third one is zero. Very easy. Okay? And the first two are our sigma max and our sigma min that we've calculated up here. Right, so those are just the equations for two principal stresses if you have a 2D stress state. Is everyone comfortable with that? Cool. Alright, and then if we have what is now three principal stresses, remembering three, remembering that the third one is zero, we can get our maximum shear, and you might have this equation as well, which is the maximum of sigma 1 minus 2 divided by 2, 2, 3, or one three. So basically the biggest difference between those, uh, and anyone that remembers more circles will know that that's basically the, the top of the more circle, which I'm going to talk about right in the next slide. Um, now that maximum shear stress, basically you take your maximum principal plane and you have to rotate it around until that shear stress becomes maximum. So you can imagine this, this cube rotating a full 360 degrees, a complete continuous rotation, right? And as you rotate, some of the vectors get longer and then shorter and then longer, depending on where the configuration is. So all this is doing is to get the maximum normals, you rotate it around, and if you were to visualise when it got to its maximum point and started going back down again, you'd say that's the maximum. And when it goes down and the shears get bigger and smaller as you rotate, and when you get to the maximum plane and the shears maximum, that's the maximum shear. All right? So these equations are just giving us those places. We're not talking about angles just yet. Um, but those equations are giving us the maximum configuration throughout a full 360 degree rotation of that cube. Alright, so those are the black box equations. Those are equations that we could just blindly apply and maybe we'd get them right. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is how to do more circles and where these equations have come from and how to actually interpret what this stuff means. Alright, um, now hopefully everyone's had at least a crack at more circles in CS2001, I am largely going to teach you my way of doing it. Um, if you're comfortable with the way you do currently, uh, and you get it right, as in you get it the same as what I get it, um, then feel free to keep doing that. If what you do is slightly different to mine, you get a different answer, then please do it my way. Alright, so, more circles. Um, You'll see probably one of the first differences is that I have shear stress up. Have you guys done shear stress down in your more circles in the past? All right, about half the textbooks on mechanics do it down, and about half the textbooks on mechanics do it up. All right, so both ways are technically correct, but if you do it up and you use the positive sign convention, then rotations on the more circle match, as in they go in the same direction as the rotations on a critical element. It all lines up and it's nicely consistent. If you do it down, then it's backwards and it just gets really confusing and easy to stuff things up. Now, I've taught in this class down and up before. Um, for the last couple of years, I've taught up because going through every single step of it, it makes much more sense to go up because of all of those things lining up and being consistent. Right, and so that's why I do it this way. I suggest you all start doing it this way as well. Um, now, 
there are always three points on a Moore's circle because there are always three principal stresses. Have you guys drawn your Moore circles this way with three circles? No? Cool, you do now. All right. Every single Moore circle you draw should have three circles on it. <laughs> or, if there's only one circle, it better be three circles all overlapping each other. Okay. Um, so, if I have a circumstance like this, so we've got a 2D stress state, we've got some tensile stresses, and we've got some compressive stresses, and that's our normal stresses. All right, sorry, our uh, principal stresses. So our third principal stress is zero. The three points on the Moore circle are sigma one is a positive, obviously. Sigma three is compressive, and so negative. And sigma two, this top face is zero. And you will draw that zero, and you will draw the circles that join all three. All right. And then the maximum shear stress that occurs at that infinitesimal location in the shaft for which you have drawn the applied stress element and then the principal stress element, only at that point, the maximum shear occurring at that point is the top of the biggest circle. All right? So for this top example, what you would have done in the past, which is that point and that point and one circle, you'd get it right. This example, where both of our principles are tensile, or out, we have positive sigma 1, we have positive <coughs> sigma 2, and if you only drew one circle, you'd be getting a maximum shear here, which is wrong, because the third principle stress is zero, making a much bigger circle, and making our maximum shear that point there. Okay, so that's the, the rationale for the three circles because zero is always a principal stress if you've got a 2D stress state. Okay. All right. Now, another point is that um, for convention, and because it makes our life a hell of a lot easier, sigma one is always bigger than sigma two, is always bigger than sigma, sigma three, okay? So, for this example, sigma one is the big one, sigma two is the zero stress state, and sigma three is the negative. For this one, sigma 1 is the big one, sigma 2 is the medium sized one, and sigma 3 is the 0 because we sequence them from right to left. Right? It just makes our life easy um, and it means you can always say sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 will give you the maximum shear as well. Um, there's other advantages, but we always, sigma, we always order the sigma 1 through to sigma 3. Alright, now. How do we actually calculate that Moore circle? <coughs> you guys should probably be relatively familiar with doing this. Um, I'm going to give you an actual, um, let's say, systematic process for doing this in the hopes that you get it right every single time. Um, and in the hopes that it will help you get your rotations for your principal planes as well. All right? And the way that we do that take our applied stress element, you notice I'm saying applied stress element, that's the element you would calculate using the method that you used in the tutorial yesterday, they were applied stress elements. And then we label the top face and the right face. Alright? Now, each of those faces is a dot that we're going to plot on the Moore circle. And if we rotated that a little bit, the stresses would change on that face and the dot would move on the Moore circle. And so as I actually rotate this whole thing around, that dot will move around the Moore circle. And the way it actually works is that it will move double around here for a single rotation. So if this rotates 180 degrees, we will go 360 degrees on this curve. Okay. And that makes sense to us, because if I look at that top face, oh, let's look at the right face for starters. We've got our positive sign convention. On that right face is my sigma x, my normal stress, positive or negative? Positive. Positive? Yeah, it's out. Positive, yeah. So that's a positive value. And that, thinking of this as a Cartesian coordinate, my normal stress, that value has to be positive. So I come along here to whatever sigma x is value in my Cartesian coordinates. Is this shear stress positive or negative on my positive sign convention? 
And let's look at the equation for sigma 3, which is C minus R. And sigma min is C minus R. Right, so that's where those equations have come from. Those equations are purely your geometric equations straight off Moore's circle. It's just that they've probably been given to you as black boxes to solve for max and min. They are purely Moore's circle equations. And you can derive them yourself on the fly if you've forgotten them, purely based on triangles. So that's, that's where they come from. And so using this or using more circle is the same game. By the time you do more circle and do those calculations on the circle, you're doing this anyway. Except chances are if you do the more circle way, you'll understand it a little bit better because you'll know where things are. And you can double check your results and make sure you haven't screwed something up. Whereas those black box equations, if they both come out positive, do you have any idea whether that's right or not? No? If I look at my circle here and I get sigma 1 and sigma 3 both being positive, have I screwed something up? Yeah, I have. Alright, so immediately you've got a second check as an engineer which is critical in every single calculation that you do. Cool. Alright, so that is a really simple way of calculating our more circles. As I said, I always want you to write top and side and then we label our points. Or sorry, top and right. We label our point on the Moore circle as we draw the point on there. And that's going to become really important in a second because in a second we're going to do the rotations and I'm going to show you how the rotations work and how you can get that right every single time as well. But before we do that, let's just have a little bit of a go at this so that you guys can have your practice. Everything that I want you to do from now on, 
And this is hard, and I understand that on uh, whatever we are, Tuesday morning, and particularly Monday morning, shoots coming in, you'd much rather just apply equations. From here on in, you guys have to think. Um, and it's hard, but that's what engineers do. And so we look at a problem, and we have to be able to think about the multiple different ways that we can solve the same thing and make sure that we've got the answer right. And so obviously, this applies for when I've got my circle to the right and the left. It'll be flipped around, and my sigma three will be the zero if it's all the way to the right, which is this particular problem. So let's do the solution. Alright, so as I said to you, the first thing that I'd like you to do is label two faces that I'm going to plot on my more circle. So let's say top and right. Now, also, if it's unfamiliar to you, you can draw your positive sign convention. Until this is absolutely second nature and you never get it wrong, draw it. Um, now, I haven't drawn my bendings on it because in this particular circumstance, I only need my normals and my shears, so it doesn't matter. So that's for my right face. This is the part that I'm interested in. And if I was to rotate that up 90 degrees, I would get something that looks like this. And that's the face that I'm interested in for my top. And that will tell me whether I have positives or negatives on my Cartesian or circle coordinate system. So let's do this. What's my normal stresses? Uh, 1 to 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Label that sigma, label that tau. And 1, 2, 3, 4 ish. Now, I don't expect you to get out a ruler and have your more circle look perfect. Two, three. But what I do expect you to do is not have a completely shit looking more circle. So try and do it neatly. Try and space it. I did that freehand. You can see it's not perfect, but it's close enough that when I draw a circle, it might look something like a circle. Alright, which is what we want. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, etc. All right. So my first point, top point, sigma y is my, or oh, the normal stress is my x value on my coordinate system. Sigma y is one megapascal, so sigma y. All right, and that's positive because the positive sign convention is up. That says up. Is my shear positive or negative? Negative. negative, and it is negative what? 1.5. So I come down here, 1.5. And then say tau xy. And I will label this point top. Top. Alright. Now I know that that point associates with my top. Um, right. Positive sigma x, and that's 5, so I come over here in the positive direction, sigma x. Tau xy, is it positive or negative? Positive, I'll value 1.5. Tau xy, I'm just putting these on so it makes it very, very, very clear. And then I'm going to label that right. Alright, and I draw my line between them. Yeah. And if you've drawn it neatly and relatively evenly, it should be fairly clear that this falls just to the right of that, but you can actually, you could even leave it and we could calculate some values um, just to confirm that. So C equals X plus, so this value plus this value divided by 2, which is going to be 5 plus 1 divided by 2 equals 3. 3 megapascals. Oh, I should also put megapascals on my axes because we always, always, always put our units. Alright, does that make sense? If I screwed something up, have I got it correct? Does it look right on the plot? Yeah? Did I accidentally go through 3? I did. Look at that. Brilliant. Alright, so we're pretty close to what I thought it should be. Alright. 
R equals the square root of this maximum minus this one, or vice versa because it's squared, doesn't really matter. 5 minus 1 over 2 squared plus tau xy is 1.5 squared, and I get R as, what do you guys get R for? 2.5 megapascals, don't forget the units. Alright, so visually we know that if the radius is 2.5, I'm going to go 3 plus 2.5, which gets me to here, and 3 minus 2.5, which gets me to here, and I've got two more points on my circle if I need them, and I can draw a terrible looking circle like so. And really, if I wanted to, I could have gone 2.5 up, which is about there, and 2.5 down, which is about there, so this is Obviously. There we go. Um, and so, now if we look at that, where do our sigma 1s, 2s, and 3s lay out? So if we, sigma 1 is the maximum, I'm going to call that sigma 1. Sigma 2 is the next one, I'm going to call that sigma 2. And obviously we always choose 0, so that's going to be sigma 3. And I can add a couple of extra little circles on that. Like so. And we can use these values either on the curve or we can use them in an equation. Doesn't really matter. We know now that sigma 1 equals 3 plus 2.5 equals 5.5 megapascals. And I like putting a little underline under that. Sigma 2 equals 3 minus. 2.5 equals 0 0.5 megapascals. Let's give a little under line under it. And sigma 3, we know is 0. Alright, looking at that, what's our maximum shear stress? What's it implied? Say again? 2.75. 2.75? So 5.5 divided by 2, or this value on your curve up here. But either way, you can see that when you do the more circles, and the reason that I ask you to do more circles pretty much from now on, is that it's not just using an equation, it's not just calculating a value, it's, it's something that's physical that you can both use equations and calculate a value for, but you can also double check your answers. So if I calculate my maximum shear stress as 2.75, I look at that circle, and if I haven't stuffed it up, it makes sense to me that that's the value. And I can double check it. I could accidentally, if I was using equations, calculate that as 2.5. And by doing the circle, I've made sure that I've got the right value for that as well. Alright, so there's lots of really important reasons to use it. Do, do those circles help, like, because it's the sigma 3, sigma 1 circle, does that mean like it, we can tell which face or whatever? Like, does that change where the max shear is going to be? Uh, yes. It does? And you can tell all of your rotations on all circles as well as you rotate around each of those circles. So it's, it's technically a 3D stress state plotted um, on, a, on a Cartesian coordinate system, which is really useful. We'll deal with the simple case of taking this element, rotating it around and working out which face has what stresses on it in the maximum principal configuration, which I think is what you're asking. Um, that's what I'll do next, uh, because by labelling them and by maintaining those points on the actual curve, we know which one's where and what. Um, but we'll get to that in the next bit. Okay? So uh, maybe have a five minute break and then we'll get on to the, the next couple of examples. Okay guys, um, so uh, hopefully you guys are a little bit more confident or confident in so much as you might not have done any more circles thus far um, in, in actually calculating those points. We're going to do another example in a minute um, and then you will be doing these for pretty much every other uh, problem that you do at least in the first half of this subject. Right, because all of our party criteria and so forth are based on at least principal stresses, um, maximum normal stresses, maximum shear stresses, that kind of stuff. So we need to calculate those values and we're going to do more circles because uh, of all of the reasons I've said. It's, it's kind of mechanical and physical and we can make sure that we're getting it right. Now the last thing is uh, rotating these around to principal planes. 
ends up who's done it, ends up who even understands the reason for it. No? So we want to know the angle that something fails on. Alright? And if we want to know the angle that something fails on, we need to find the angle that the maximum stress that caused that failure occurs on. Maybe not for when you're designing something, but if you've just been assigned a project in industry where something has broken um, and all of the production has gone down and you need to diagnose where that fault occurred and you have some sort of shaft that's been fractured at some plane, all right? You analyse that shaft and then you want to know what actually, what stress state was occurring at that angle, at that failure plane to actually cause that failure. That'll actually tell you things about the mechanism of the failure. Was it fatigue? Was it normal stress? Was it shear stress? How did that actually progress? Was it the maximum stresses or was there something else happening? And so being able to calculate the stress, but then also work out what the stress is at different angles is really important, particularly for root cause analysis. So I'm going through rotating this round to find the actual angle of those principal planes for a very specific purpose, not just because you can do it and for you know for fun. Right? So there are very good diagnostic reasons that we understand the way that we rotate these rounded principal planes and what planes those occur at. Alright. So we've labeled our points. And we know, or I'm telling you, that rotation around more circles is mirrored by rotation around the element. And that element, once I rotate it around to those principal plates, that angle is our principal, you know, uh, principal face, principal plane. All right, so let's say that I have this element. I've labeled my top and right face. And on my Moore circle, obviously I'm just drawing a single Moore circle on the three Moore circles so it's clear when I actually do this explanation, but when you do it, you'll do the three. Uh, I've labelled my right face, so I've got a positive and a negative shear, so positive normal, negative shear, I've labelled my right face. On my top face, I've labelled my negative normal and positive shear, and I've got my top face, so I know where on that circle the current configuration is. So if I was to say, you know, top face at zero degrees and right face at 90 degrees or whatever, you know, that at that configuration, this is the stress state. And so if that's a shaft, maybe do it nicer, it'll be a bit easier to see. <laughs> Alright, let's say I have some sort of shaft and I've just taken a stress element like this. And I've calculated my applied stresses at this configuration it is those things. I'm going to do it in 2D just because drawing rotations in ISO is a challenge on an element. Right. So let's say our critical stress is here. I've taken a box and I want to know what the stresses are. That's exactly what we've done, right? That's exactly what you've done in class in the example you <coughs> Alright? Now, arbitrarily and without even realising, you guys chose your stress element on the, you know, on the x, y axis, nice and rectangular square, because that's what we can calculate with bendings and torsions and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's where we calculate the stress element. Now, if I just arbitrarily said, alright, I want to know what the stress looks like on an element that looks like this. You could calculate different stresses, and if it's in tension, it might look like that. You might have shear stress that does these ones, and so forth. And that's what we're talking about with rotating that element. I'm not talking about physically taking your element and rotating in space. I'm talking about the reference frame, the box that I chop out of the shaft. I chop a different angle, and I'll get different stresses. Rotate around, chop a different angle, I'll get different stresses. Okay, so don't, don't get caught up thinking that I'm actually moving a box in space. I'm moving my reference frame on a shaft that stays there. Right. And so what I want to do is, as I've done this, I've done my circle and I've calculated sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3, I want to know what reference frame those actually occur on. Right. What angle, how far do I have to rotate my reference frame to get to that? 
And because I've labelled top, I can work out which direction I need to move top in. All right? Where's the closest, or what's the least rotation that I need to make to get to a principal stress? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? Anti, I come down here. I could just as easily go clockwise if I want. It just means I have to move it more. All right? So, let's go anti-clockwise. I come down this far, and as I rotate around this, obviously, this is a straight line, so wherever I rotate, both points have to move with me. All right? So this point rotates down, this one goes up, and it rotates down by, I've just labelled it, whatever that is, alpha. Yeah? And so that angle on the circle, which I can get from my trigonometry, is mirrored in the rotation of this space, except 50% of the rotation, because I've got 360 degrees here, and I've only got 180 degrees to get back to a, a similar face there. So they're just uh, they're kind of a ratio of two is to one. So if I calculate alpha, I know that this face has to rotate in the same direction by half that amount. Right, so if I take this face, let's say that's 20, I can rotate, and we're rotating counterclockwise. So I rotate that face counterclockwise by 10. And that's the new configuration. That I, that I use. Now, is sigma 3 positive or negative? Negative. Positive sign convention tells us skin is negative. So, once I've taken that plane, rotated it around, I map on that plane all of my Cartesian values. Right? So, I have negative sigma 3, and do I have any shear? No, shear is zero. So, my two vectors that I put on that face are the Cartesian values on my circle. And that just happens to be negative sigma 3 into it and no shear. Now let's do the same thing with the right face. I've got my right face here. Once again, I'm rotating counterclockwise by half of alpha. So if alpha is 20, that's 10. So I rotate counterclockwise by 10. And then I plot on my face whatever values that is. So that is positive sigma 1 is my normal stress, and zero is my shear stress. So I look over here, I've plotted positive sigma one. Now, if I was to reconstruct those two faces into the two faces of a cube, I'd get my top and my right like this. Are you confident that you could do the bottom and the left if you knew half a cube? We know full well that if you've got half a cube, the other half a cube mirrors it exactly, right? So. Once I've worked out the angle of my top and the angle of my right, I rotate it around and I've got that stress, that stress, I know what stresses occur on it because I've got the directions because I've got the points on my curve. The, the curve tells me exactly what those values should be. And I now know that this element occurs at alpha on 2 up from the horizontal in that configuration. Okay? Now, if I took my right uh, top face here, Remembering that that's our point. And I only rotated down half alpha, down here. Can I still draw that cube? Absolutely. So, however much I rotate on here, I just divide by 2. So if that's 20, I've come down 10. So now I need to divide by 2, I go down 5. What's the value of normal stress at this point? I don't know, something a bit less than sigma 3, but a negative yet. So sigma 3 is some value, something less than that, we know it. What's my value of shear stress, positive or negative? Positive and non-zero. So if I take my top plane, the top, and I've rotated it down, and let's say that that's 5 degrees, and I've got some sort of a negative sigma going on, and some sort of a positive shear stress going on, and those values, I've got a stress element. And I can do the same thing on the right face. What I'm getting at here is this circle is an infinite number of stress combinations that covers the entire rotation of that element at every single point, at every single combination of stress. It just so happens that the ones we're most interested in are the ones we're applied at, because that helps us to draw the circle, the normal, uh, sorry, the principal stresses, because I'm going to relate them to failure criteria, and also the maximum shear stress because I'm going to relate that to different failure criteria. Okay. So, that being said, let's now do the same process 
for the maximum shear stress element. So I've got my maximum normal stress element. I know what angle that occurs at. I'm going to do it for my maximum shear stress element. Because if I do this rotation on my shaft that failed, and my failure plane doesn't line up with any of this angle, I can come over here and say, all right, well, I've got this, and I had to rotate it around this way. And so my maximum normal plane is this way, but your shaft is actually, you know, broke this way. You're like, all right, maybe maximum normal stress wasn't the reason this broke. I wonder what maximum shear stress, what angle that occurs at. And so let's rotate it back around and see what angle the maximum shear stress occurs at, and see whether that lines up to our, you know, failure line. All right, so we do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just that we rotate now round to where we know the maximum shear stress is rather than the maximum normal stress. So the maximum shear stress occurs at the top and technically the bottom, just in the negative. Yeah. So our top, the closest place to move it is around the top here. Actually, well, before I do that, remember I said you can go either way with this point to get to the maximum normal stress? If I go from this point and rotate all the way around to here, that's basically 180 minus alpha divided by 2. Effectively what I'm doing is taking that top plane and instead of just rotating it down to here, I'm rotating it all the way around and I'm going to get to here. And so I get this stress on it and I label it as top, but then right has to rotate all the way back around to here by the same amount to get to the bottom. And I have exactly the same stress element it's just that I've rotated one way as opposed to the other. It will always give me that same solution. Okay. So, in this circumstance, we're going to take that top and rotate it here because it's the closest. But once again, I can go all the way down the bottom here and I get the same configuration, same resulting stress vectors. It's just, you know, I have to move more. So, top rotates up here. We can calculate that angle as whatever, I think I've called it thigh. And we take our top. And we rotate the same direction, and this is why we have this axis up, because the same direction makes life easy. I rotate by half thigh in that direction, half thigh in that direction, and I have some combination of stress. Do I have shear stress here? Yes. Is it positive or negative? Positive. I look at my positive sign convention, and that means it's going down here. Do I have normal stress here? Yep. Whatever value of C is. And so I have to add a, add a normal stress, and that's a positive, so normal stress out of the page. Excellent. I've got all my stress vectors on that. I take my right, and I rotate it once again clockwise down to my maximum shear in the negative. So right, rotate <coughs> clockwise to whatever thigh on two is. And at that point, normal stress positive, shear stress negative. Look at my sign convention and draw them on. And again, I have two faces of my four faces that I can just duplicate under it. Okay. So, once you label that top and the right face, and you understand that the way that these points actually rotate is a continuum, it's continuous all the way around that circle, any angle of faces that you want to calculate the stresses on, you can read straight off this more circle, then it becomes pretty straightforward to get those types of rotations. And let's say that maybe that rotation has rotated us around to a plane similar to this. And you might actually identify that shear stress was the failure mechanism, which could tell you something about the material that was chosen, and maybe that was inappropriate, given that there's lots of shear stress there, or something like that. All right? Now, if shear stress was something like this, and you've got a failure plane in the middle, that's telling you that you've got some combination of normal and shear causing failure. And once again, that tells you things about the materials. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about failure criterion. But it's very useful to be able to identify what planes the maximum normal, maximum shear occurs at for a particular area in a material. Okay? And so that's why we do these types of things. So if you're going to make a shear like that, does that mean it would fail by diagonally through that element? Through that plane. Yeah, yeah, through yeah exactly. So if, if your max shear element looks like this, and maximum shear was the critical thing, maybe if that's you know 30 degrees and that's 60 degrees and this is your shaft, you're more likely to see one going up this plane at 60 degrees than you would at 30 degrees. But either of those, if you have a failure on either of those planes, you can say, at least as a starting point for your diagnosis, 
yes, all right, I've got maximum shear going along here. I know ductile materials fail due to maximum shear, blah, 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 that, that potentially will happen. Now, if you have a ductile material that fails on shear planes and your failure is along the, the actual, the maximum normal stress plane, that raises a question. And maybe that question is, what's happened to the material in the service life that has formed it? Because as I'll talk about in a minute, um, or the next lecture, maybe next week, um, brittle materials fail on maximum normal stress plane, whereas ductile materials fail on the maximum shear stress plane. Okay? So if you've just identified that this thing is a, it started out as a ductile material, but it failed on a maximum normal stress plane, Maybe something's happened to that material that's made it go brittle where it was ductile. And that might be cyclic heat conditions or it could have been uh, dud material batch initially or, or some of those things. And it starts to give you that mechanism to say, why has it broke? Can I avoid it breaking in the future? Okay. So it's a really useful tool to be able to identify those planes. And that's why I'm banging on about it for a little while. A lot of the time, um, or in the past, there's, there's been the, you know, you brush over more circles and, oh yeah, you can rotate it around, but I don't really care about that because we don't use it for anything. We don't use it for a lot in this class, but as an actual engineer in practice, you need to be able to think, all right, I need to diagnose this. Is there something I can do with these planes and rotate it around? So we're going to have a bit of practice at it, and hopefully that's a, a tool at your disposal when you need it. Okay? All right. Um, that's all the slides I've got, so let's do another example, including the rotations. Um, and then we'll, uh, depending on where we're at, we might call it a day after that. There we go. So, you know pretty much what you did before. Calculating the three principal stresses. This time you're calculating the maximum shear stress. And you're going to draw for me the maximum principal or the principal stress elements in its rotated configuration and the maximum shear stress element in its rotated configuration. Now, I will highlight for you one thing at this point and I might talk about it more. Maximum shear stress. When I ask for the maximum shear stress, I'm talking about the maximum, the actual 
maximum from Moore's circle. I'm not talking about the place where I'm not talking about the place where applied shear stress is maximum. All right. Let's recall for a second what a beam in bending might look like. All right. If I've got a force there and this is a wall, I know that if I had stress elements like this, all right, I've got tension here. I've got compression there, and I've got uh, down transverse shear like that. This is not the maximum shear stress because this element has shear stress on it as well, or this place in the material has shear stress on it as well. I just have to take this element and rotate it a bit, and I get shear stress. I take this element and rotate a bit, I can get normal stress. I take this element and rotate a bit, I can get shear stress. Because every single element has all of those different configurations on the Morse circle. All right? So just because it's got applied shear stress doesn't mean it's the maximum shear stress. And if I was to, just as an example, draw three Morse circles, because I draw a Morse circle for every single bit of the material. The top one. I have on my front face a positive and nothing and no shear, so that's a point here, and then everything else is zeros. And maximum shear is here. On this one, I have a shear, and if I was to rotate that around there, down, down is negative, and then on that face is positive, so I have a shear point negative for one face and positive. So in this case, I would say, let's say, right top. In this case, I would say x, y, uh, then top is the positive, right, your circle looks like that, and this one is negative, so right, top, Okay, so you see at that's actually the center there. You see at all three configurations, I have shear stress and I have a potential for maximum shear stress. Now, if this circle is bigger than this circle, then that maximum shear stress is more. And as we know about bending and transverse shear, bending is almost always more significant than transverse shear, and so chances are that's probably going to be the place where I have my maximum shear stress. All right, so. Just in terms of terminology, if I ask you for maximum shear stress, very frequently I ask people give me a transverse shear applied stress element. That is not correct. You need to find me the maximum shear stress based on more circles, normal stresses, etc. Okay? Alright, have a go at that. Alright, so, top face is my point, 
Top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. We're on the curve. So if I was to draw a point, would it be in this quadrant, this quadrant, this quadrant, or this quadrant for my top face? Top left. Top left? Yeah. She's up here. Uh, normal stress is negative 5, and shear stress is 3.5, which is the same back there. Top. Everyone happy with that? Yep, good. Alright, that puts us uh, in our right face in our bottom here. So we've got 15 across, and we've got a negative 3.5. Right. Put a line through that, so we're guessing that well, between 5 and 15 you're probably going to hit somewhere. I might have drawn that a bit high there. Probably going to go through that 5. I think we calculate that properly. Now C equals 15 minus 5 minus 2 equals 5 megapascals. Everyone see is 5? Yeah. Alright, now if I calculate, I can draw my circle now or I can calculate my radius just to make it a bit easier to look at, make it look circular. Um, radius equals the square root of 15 plus 5 is 20, or 2 is 10 squared plus 3.5 squared. What do you all get? 10.59 megapascals. Excellent. All right. So from about here it goes up to about here, it goes down to about here, comes out 5 plus 10 point something. So she's pretty close there. She's pretty close there. And I've got some points on the circle. Draw my badly shaded. More circles. All right. Do I need other circles on there? Yes. Obviously. <laughs> Feel free to do better with a whiteboard man. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm happy with that. You do that on the exam. You get it right. If you get the numbers right, if it looks like a more circle, it's not a dog's breakfast, then it's fine. Um, if you can draw a near circle, feel free. Don't spend 40 minutes doing a wall circle where you can spend five, because you've got lots of other stuff to do. Um, so get it out, get it done quick. Um, now, obviously, we're going to sequence this as sigma one sigma 2 and sigma 3, which tells us what the equations to each of those are going to be. Sigma 1 is just C plus R, which looking at it should be 15.59 megapascals. Everyone got that yet? Great. Sigma 2 equals what? Zero, zero. Megapascals. And sigma 3 equals what? Negative how much? 5.59 watt. Okay. Alright, um, and what else do we need to calculate? We need to calculate the maximum shear. So I can say, let's say T max, tau max. And what was that? tutorial on Monday, feel free to practice between now and then. Last thing we need to do is orientations. Alpha, just using truth. 
because basically all we're doing is reading this point off the curve. So this point is 5 across and 10.9 up, and that's what we plot on that face for the top. Yeah? Thank you. 